Hey folks, happy new year. Welcome 2022, third year of the Panini. Uh, my name is Nick Taylor. I'm a lead software engineer at Forum. Forum is a software that powers death. I'm Christina Gorton. I'm the developer advocate at Forum. And today we have another developer advocate with us, but from Steps In, we have Anthony Campolo. So Anthony, tell us about yourself a little before we talk about Steps In. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Super happy to be here. Um, I've watched this stream a bunch. Actually, I'm really a big fan of uh, Dev in general as like, you know, a company and a big um, advocate of open source technology. And um, Lucy has been on this stream also, one of my coworkers. So it's really great to, to be here. And uh, I am a developer advocate at StepZen. I'm going to be showing you what StepZen is. It's a tool for creating GraphQL APIs on any data source. So in this example, we're going to be using the dev API to build out like a whole kind of content mesh type thing where you can just pull in anything you want with any sort of GraphQL queries because the, the dev API is a, is a REST API and we have something called the Step Zen Studio, which will make it really easy to hook into that and get going and writing some queries really quickly. So I think it's going to be really fun and I'm um, looking forward to it. Awesome. Oh, cool, yeah. Yeah, I'm super excited to... Uh kind of work around uh, work with all this stuff uh we, we were talking just before the stream how uh i was using dev as my blog uh, data source and due to some recent deprecations i need to actually <laughs> implement it again so this is probably a, a good good way for me to to get something up for my blog so yeah super excited to have you here uh talk we'll be talking some graphql too i know I know I can't speak for Christina, but I know I don't have tons of GraphQL experience. Me, it's been more Hello World stuff. And uh, uh, when I had a Gatsby blog, uh, just made the queries in there. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm excited to dig into all this and also uh, just digging into the Dev API. Uh, we'll drop, I'll drop, uh, Christina and me will drop a link to the Dev2 API. So if folks can mm -hmm. kind of take a peek at that while we, we get started here. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess, yeah, where do you want to start exactly? Do you want to maybe talk a bit about GraphQL first? Maybe why why would somebody want GraphQL to begin with? Uh, I think that's yeah, a good starting yeah, definitely. point. GraphQL is something that is fairly well known as like this new kind of hyped up technology. So I think most devs these days will have heard of GraphQL, but in terms of using it, it kind of varies depending on your experience with different frameworks and tools and what sort of like APIs you're working with. And for me, I, I got into GraphQL originally through Redwood JS, which is a full stack okay. React framework that is integrated with GraphQL as like the way that the front end and the back end talk to each other. And this is really interesting because the, the high level description of what GraphQL is, is that it's a query language for APIs. And what that okay. means is, SQL is a query language for databases, for relational databases specifically. But you can, if you think about an API, <clears throat> it's much more general than that because it could be any sort of data source that can be in any structure and that can be accessed in sort of any way. So when you're working with just like a wide range of different APIs and you have REST APIs and you're pulling from different REST APIs, you're trying to integrate them into this one project, it can get really complicated because you have a lot of different conventions based on whose API you're working with. And mm -hmm. GraphQL, it, to standardize it, it has a specific query language and conventions around how to work with it. And the reason that they created it was <clears throat> to basically match the mental model of the front-end developers. And this mm -hmm. is why it's, it's really cool to work with because the queries are as simple as you could possibly make them. Like mm -hmm. when you see how you write GraphQL queries, you basically say, this is the thing I want this object and I want these specific fields on that object. And then it just gives you okay. that data. So we'll actually have to show, we'll be working with lots and lots of queries today. So we'll, we'll get into more of what that kind of means, but that's like kind of my high level, like description of what it is and why it was created and why it's useful. Um, yeah. I really like that because, uh, like Nick said, like I haven't worked with it a ton, but when I have worked with it, I haven't been intimidated intimidated by it as much as like say when I was first learning how to like use you know REST APIs and stuff. Because just like you said, I feel like it does kind of cater to 
uh, you know, the the way front end developers think and they make it really easy to to do those queries. So that's really cool that that was their intention. <laughs> yeah. I, I I do have a question about it though. Like like because we're talking we're talking front end centric here at the moment, but it's it's not just a front end centric thing. Like obvi obviously it, it does make things simpler for someone working in the front end because they can just say hit this endpoint, make some query. I mean at some aggregated kind of query but i mean this is this is something that's like production ready use like like there's back end apis all all over the place it's not just for front ends right yeah so this is a really important distinction to make which is that it is meant to enable front end developers to be able to do more without necessarily having to constantly bring in the back end developers to create more bespoke endpoints for them but it is not a front end technology. It is a full stack technology. And this is why I was yeah. saying that Redwood JS is what got me involved in it because Redwood JS is the idea that you'll have a project with two basically things in it, your front end and your back end. And so you have a web folder, which is basically like a React app, any sort of React app you've ever worked with. And then the back end is a GraphQL API. And the GraphQL API connects to an ORM, which then can connect to a Postgres database. But you, you create both of those simultaneously. You create a schema mm -hmm. on the back end and you create queries on the front end. And what's great about the GraphQL Studio that I'm going to be showing today is that the schemas are already made for you and the, the endpoints are already connected for you. So they're already set up where you can just start writing queries. And mm -hmm. this is because people already figured out how to integrate those different REST APIs and, and write the schemas for you but the back end is still there and if you want to tweak it and if you want to change your schema you can also do that and if you want to add in more other endpoints like if you think okay well this is cool but i also have like photos in like cloudinary and i want to like be able to bring those in too and i also have you know maybe i have like a second <laughs> blog over on wordpress mm -hmm. just because it's been a while and i don't want to get rid of it so you want to pull in two blogs and combine them into one thing you can do that as well with steps and so it's Kind of when, when people talk about like the front of the front end and the back of the front end, that's become like a kind of big term, which is like the front of the front end is like your HTML and CSS and the back of the front end is like your, your JavaScript kind of data fetching stuff like that. There's a similar thing now with the back end. You have the front of the back end and the back of the back end. And so the back of the back end is where the data yeah, actually yeah. is. That's, that's the database. That's like the data living in, in dev. And then the front of the back end is the steps end. It's this gateway into all of this backend stuff. So Sebsen is a backend technology. It was a backend technology that's meant to enable front-end developers. Yeah, I just dropped, there's a, there's a, a great blog post from Brad Frost who talks about this year, the front-end of the front-end or the back-end of the front-end and so on. So just pop that in there for folks that are interested. Uh, I think even though I don't have a ton of experience with GraphQL, I, I see there being other great uses of it. So like, for example, when we're using a Gatsby blog, uh, or Gatsby, no, it's not a blog. Um, <laughs> you know, you're you're reading in these markdown as you know as as data sources, you know, and and just being able to query them. I think that's pretty powerful. So like, yes, you can have these dynamic uh, pieces of information coming in, like you're saying, like from Cloudinary or other APIs. But you can also include static data, and like for the person consuming the GraphQL endpoint, that that's completely transparent to them. So I, I think it's it's kind of neat. Uh, in that sense, um, and and one one thing that I, I I've heard people say before though is like, well, it just sounds like it's open season, you know, like I can just open GraphQL and just say give me whatever I want without any restrictions. But <clears throat> from what I've read, it just like other kinds of uh, mechanisms and like REST or whatever, you know, it's just because. GraphQL can provide all of this, it doesn't mean you'll necessarily get access to it because you, you know, you can still limit who sees what and so on. Like I'm, I'm assuming through the schemas or some kind of authentication mechanism. Yeah. Yeah. You can't throw away off like just wholesale. And it, when you first build, like, like when you naively build a GraphQL API and you just like throw it up online, it will be kind of open by, by default, but there's many, many authentication mechanisms that are built in. Actually, Stebzen itself is giving you a layer of security in that to access your GraphQL API that you create on Stebzen, you have API keys. And so once we build out the front end in this example project, we'll kind of show how to do that. So 
you are going to have your own basically locked down API that you build with Stetson, okay. and then those connect themselves to APIs that have their own keys. So you have keys to access the the backends through your gateway, and then you have keys to access your gateway. So there's already two levels of security that are going to be built in. Then you can also do more okay. fine grained role based access control with like directives and, and things like that, which is like way beyond the scope of what we'll be talking about today. But yeah, that's a, that's a whole other world and, and okay. universe of, of GraphQL. Yeah. Cool, cool. All right. So I say, why, why don't we just jump in and start building something then? Yep. Yeah, sounds good. So I will go ahead and share my screen. So I want. And if anyone has questions in the chat as we're going along, feel free to put them in the chat. We'll we'll answer them as we can. So keep yeah. that in mind. Oh, all right. Yeah, I'm not yeah, seeing the chat can. right now, but definitely happy to we'll answer throw any the questions. At you, at so you don't have point. to. Yeah. yeah. All right. So this is the. StepZen GraphQL Studio. So it's just graphql.stepzen.com. And this is a bunch of pre-made uh, schemas and connections to API. So if you see this list, we have uh, things like Airtable, and then Contentful, like CMSs, and then we have uh, like all sorts of different APIs for like Google, like Natural Language okay. API, GitHub mm -hmm. API, um, then you have like things like the JSON placeholder API if you want like some quick mock data, things like SendGrid, oh, cool. Slack, uh, Spotify, Twitter, and then there's also um, pre-made combinations of different ones already put together for you. So like the developer publishing pack already gives you Dev, GitHub, and Twitter all integrated oh, that's together, cool. or like okay, Google nice. Maps and Yelp kind of integrated together, and. The one I'll start with will be dev. And so when you add a schema in, it's going to ask you for your keys. And okay. so this is what I was talking about in terms of like putting the keys in. Yeah. And and for people that are curious, if you are using the dev to AP, OK, yeah, you're showing us. OK, perfect. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. So if you go to your dev account here and you go to settings and account, then you can find your your keys. So I have mm -hmm. one that I've been using, and then I created a new one for this stream specifically. And okay. I'm going to hop off screen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, but bef before we continue, I just have to give a shout out to one of those APIs that were integrated. I saw there. It said Frankfurter API. I'm assuming that's the hot dog API. <laughs> yeah, it must be. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that just made me made me giggle. Nice. Uh, wait. Yeah. So Anthony is actually doing what I didn't do when we had Andrew Brown on talking about Terraform. <laughs> I exposed my API keys uh, twice during that stream, uh, which uh, I've, I've done it so which, many times. Though. I got I got yeah. you beat on this one. I was going. <laughs> I was on a stream and I needed to send API keys to the host, and I copy pasted it, and I had it on my clipboard. And then I didn't realize that because I thought I still had a link on my clipboard. I tried to post okay. in a chat, and I posted my API keys <laughs> into the chat. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I, I guess in my case, it would have been a little harder. They would have had to memorize what was on the screen, but still. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah. yeah good times. Right. Good times. <laughs> back, back on screen. OK. okay. So once you All grab right. your, your dev key, then you close that and then you put it in here so you just click the configure button and then it says what's your dev key you put it in and then you hit save and so now we're already configured and ready to go and so okay we're gonna just do like a test query here and the way you can figure out kind of how to write a query is you can look at the docs which are going to be over here and there's actually a kind of easier even simpler way to get started though which is just hold control and hit space and then you'll get to see all of the different things that are available mm -hmm. to you. So the first one I want to start with will be just getting myself. So I want to get my information from my dev account. So I'm going to do get user. And then this is going to, I think, have, let me just grab and have a, a couple kind mm -hmm. of queries already. Yep written 
Call of Duty for a bit. You probably know these queries better than me. I've barely used <laughs> the Dev <laughs> API myself. <laughs> yeah, well, let's, so these are going to be the GraphQL queries that are going to be already connected to it. So for GraphQL queries, okay. you have basically like arguments that you can put in. So we're doing a get user query and then we're feeding it um, like basically what, how we're going to get it. So you can do it by like your, you have like a user ID and things mm -hmm. like that. But then you also have like your just username itself. So we're going to be searching by my username. And then let me just start by grabbing these ones first off. So this is going to give back the, the name, a summary, and then uh, the GitHub username, location, and then profile okay. image. And then, oh, that's right. So later on, I'm going to take this schema and slightly change it. Mm -hmm. So I took the, the prefix off of it. Okay. And, and, so... and to be clear, just to be clear here, so like dev2 underscore get user, that's one of the built-in queries of the the schema that ships in steps in, right? So if we click here, you will actually see your schema. So when I was doing the, the control space to do the autocomplete, it's, mm -hmm. okay. it introspects your schema. So this is one of the things that makes GraphQL really nice, the developer tooling that goes along with it, because we have all of our types here already. So for someone who's okay. like really into, into typing and stuff like that, and like the autocomplete and the introspection, like error handling and stuff like that you get from types, you get that with GraphQL. And so this is like a whole schema. It's, it's pretty built out already. We're not going to use this entire schema, but it's here for mm -hmm. you if you want to use it. And then you can find the, the queries in there. So, um, get okay. user. so this is <clears throat> that actual query that we, we ran. So you see, you have to give the ID and the URL and then this at rest directive. This is where the, the steps and magic is happening. This is the really key. This one line here is, is okay. doing so much heavy lifting for you. It's like really hard to, <laughs> to like emphasize how, how much is being done for you right here. This is okay. allowing you to not have to write an entire Apollo server like resolver setup to do this translation for you because we're taking this endpoint here, which we can check out if we just go do this. Then, uh, whoops. So I want to get. I already had the dev API open over here actually. So you actually want to talk just a little bit about the dev API for anyone who isn't familiar with it. Yeah. So uh, so folks familiar with Dev two. Um, we also have an API, and this allows you to do many things. You can query your own data, other people's data through a REST API. You can do really cool stuff, like you can actually publish an article through the API. There's, mm -hmm. I think it's somebody on the Azure team created, uh, I can't remember the name of the site, but they have a, uh, it's, I think it's a browser extension that allows you to schedule posts because that's something that we don't have in dev uh, or in forum instances. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, you can basically build so many cool things on top of this. And I know there's definitely other companies that use this too. Like I think daily, mm -hmm. daily dev does uh hash node must because they uh they allow you to import dev articles um hmm. so there's uh and and uh, even though it's deprecated now there was that stack bit integration which was using it uh and i i know there's just a ton of people using it and it's it's definitely what i have to do for my blog now because there's no way i'm switching up my blog now i'm just hmm. <laughs> i just gotta get that working again <laughs> nice yeah yeah so <clears throat> This is what makes the, the studio really nice is that we're already set up to, to write queries really quickly because we're able to just kind of input our key and then start writing queries based on the, the schema we have. And then you can actually export it if you want. So we have a, an endpoint here already, and then we can actually do the same query over here and then oh, okay, get cool. back. And so if we wanted to then integrate this into a project, we can do that and we can also uh, publish it as well. So if you wanted to just download it into a zip file and open it up, then you'll have this whole steps and project already made for you. And so before the studio exists, because the studio's only been around for like a couple months and mm -hmm. the way you would use steps and, you know, kind of 
quote unquote normally just like as a project you would have this thing here which is okay. gives you like a single index.graphql file that then hooks into other schemas and this is the the dev schema so it took that exact schema we already had and then it exported it for us and then now we also have a couple of those sample queries already written for us you may recognize okay. this that's a lucia yeah, yeah, Lucia just popped in the chat, actually. She's talking uh, old school XML with uh, my f with Matt from uh, OpenSauce. Oh, cool. Oh, what's up, Matt? <laughs> all right, so questions so far on all that? Uh, no, I, I like just how you quickly you were able to do this. Um, yeah. I, I guess I, because I, I feel like in the past this would have been uh, not a... Not necessarily a difficult task if you were familiar with GraphQL, but probably take a lot longer. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, yeah, I guess I have some questions about the Steps and Studio itself. So I imagine like yeah. where you're creating the queries right now. That's like, uh, is that that's built on top of Graphy the Graphy QL exploit? I don't know if I'm saying that right. I always call it Graphy QL, <laughs> but yeah, well, yeah, graphical is usually how people graphical. It. So yeah, this yeah. is the thing you would usually. Think of <clears throat> this is built on the you see it right here up in the top left graphical. This mm -hmm. is the open source graphical thing right now. The Steps and okay. Studio is an entirely new product that was created from the ground up by the Steps and team. And there's okay. there's similar things that are built out for other GraphQL services like Hasura and Apollo. They have like their own kind of built out you know uh, dashboards and ways of, of querying, but this is the only one that integrates all these APIs for you. So that is really like the, okay. the key special sauce that is built in here already is all of these API integrations and the pre-made schemas already and the configuration to figure out how to authenticate into them. That's not something you're okay. gonna be able to get anywhere else. Yeah. Um, I know we're not gonna do it now because we're working with the Dev2 API today, but uh, like I see on the bottom there, connect your own data source. So I imagine, you can bring in whatever you want in there. Uh, so you can you can create your own templates, I guess, as well, not just the out of the box ones. Oh yeah, yeah, because it still gives you all the other things that StepSend can do. Because when we're integrating these APIs, all we're doing is just taking an API that we already know devs use and enjoy and then building a StepSend schema for that. So if you wanted to go through the process of hooking up something like the dev API, if it hadn't already been made for you, you can do that. And this is like all the example projects I've been building kind of like over this last year as I've been working for Steps and it's basically like integrating all this stuff, like I've done Fauna, okay. I've done Storyblock, I've done Prismic, I've done like Superbase, I've done uh, a, a ton. And I've even done ones where I will create a step a Redwood project that has a GraphQL okay. API deploy that API to a Netlify function and then take that Netlify function endpoint and stick that into a steps and schema. Okay. Okay. So it's, it's really like Lego mishmash, do whatever you want pretty much, which is yeah. uh, pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. So a couple other queries that I want to show. So this one will be to get articles, which will be, mm -hmm. and I'm going to keep forgetting to do that. And so this is going to give me back all my Dev2 articles. And you can specify how much uh, per page you want to do. So if I want to just okay. do three per page, I can get my last three articles here. So we have a okay. Crypto one. We got a Astro. If anyone knows Astro. And then how to connect a Next.js front end to your Redwood API. And we get things like the title the description, the you can get the date in different formats. If you wanted to, let's see, um, it's published at. So you can get the actual date time here, mm -hmm. or you can get something that you want to actually put on like your blog that is easier to read. And then we get the, the image, cover image right here. And then you get the tags. And you can get the tags in an array instead. You get the slug. So if you want to, what we'll be doing with the with the blog, you can take the, the like the URL and then have like links to the actual thing from the thing okay. itself. So yeah, this is. And then if you want to just like get everything, like all of my posts, then you can okay. do that. And yeah. 
Yeah, no, that's cool. And again, just this super fast getting this all up and running, which is pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. And then I also, because I am a big podcaster, you can get even my podcasts through the Dev API, which is going to be at 60 FS Jam episodes. Okay. Nice. See lots of jam. Yeah. <laughs> Always jamming. All right, cool. Um, do either of you know anything about SvelteKit? I haven't used SvelteKit. Uh, Switz was on the stream last year, and he was just kind of, we were talking about his book, but he was also talking about Svelte, but it was just pure Svelte at that point, not mm -hmm. SvelteKit. Is, is this kind of like equivalent to like a Next.js or like a, a Redwood? Like it's a meta framework or? Yeah, so it's definitely... Uh, very similar to Next.js, the idea being, so it's a Svelte meta framework. And so what Next does for React, adding things like server-side rendering, static generation, and um, all okay. that kind of stuff, SvelteKit does that for Svelte. And it uh, uses Vite as well, which is kind of this, like new like uh, bundler, it's kind of like our Webpack replacement. And it's a really cool tool, and it's a great way to connect to steps and actually because it gives you kind of like functions out of, out of the box really really easily and so we're going to create like a step zen uh spelt kit project and nice. we're going to use the the dev queries that we've been writing to do that and because the thing that i like about the studio is it makes it really easy for someone to get going really quickly and they can like write mm -hmm. their queries and then figure out what they actually, what data they want to get back. And then they can work backwards from the queries. So they can take the queries and then they can say, okay, well, I only need these parts of the schema that I've been using. So I can bring in parts of the schema. And then at the end, you'll have a project with just the schema you want and just the queries you want. And then you can bring that into your okay. front end very, very easily. Oh, that's cool. Uh, let me just make sure this is set up and going. Yeah, I still haven't messed around with Svelte, but when he, from what I've I've seen a couple of videos about it, and when Sean was talking about it, it's kind of neat how they go with the approach of compiling away versus kind of like React or other frameworks where it's just like reevaluating these things like through the renders. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's just kind of interesting. All right, so now we're set up and going with our spelt project here so i just did the the really bare bones boilerplate one instead of like the whole kind of demo app and we yeah. have an src folder with a route and the route is to index.svelte and if we wanted to create cool. another one we would say do route.svelte and say new and then we would go over to forward slash new route and we got our new route already so it's set up for single page app multi-page app kind of whatever you want to do and it also gives you a really easy way to hook into your endpoint but before we get to that i got a couple other things i need to connect so we're going to have a config.yaml file okay and this is this is the first part of steps and connecting to your back end and then we're going to connect to steps okay. in after this but first what we're going to do is we're going to put our dev to api key here so i'm going to hop off again yeah don't show us that the same key that i inputted in the beginning into the the steps in studio It's a big and screen for a sec. All right, we're back. Cool. All right, let's do this. Cool. Okay, and so over here in our actual steps and project, this is the index.graphql that is going to combine 
all of our schema files together because what I did is I took the we had just like one file with the entire dev2 schema in it and I broke mm -hmm. it up yeah. into a couple just kind of separate concerns these should be fairly intuitive they're just based on the naming of the the dev2 API you can get user information articles followers comments organizations and organization inf information and then podcasts and then okay. each of these will live inside our schema folder here. So I'm going to grab this. And so this is going to create a type for the dev2 user. And then we mm -hmm. have things like GitHub username and joined at location. Those are type string. And then ID is type int. And then we have the get user query, which takes in the ID and the URL. And sorry about the noise outside it might be trash container. i know worries construction pandemic anything goes in 2022 so <laughs> don't sweat it <laughs> I, I was going to ask you about the the schema there because i've done a ton of typescript and I, I can't remember if the exclamation mark means optional in graphql or or does it mean it's mandatory so it's um it yeah it means uh, it's mandatory based as um non nullable is the term so if you don't get back one of these fields then it throws an error. And okay. I think I'm actually gonna take those. Actually, I gotta off. correct myself. It's a question mark in TypeScript for optional. Sorry. <laughs> <There we go. laughs> yeah. So you then to actually get this deployed. Actually, one more thing to show. We have our steps and config here which is going to set our url for the endpoint and then you need to tell it the if you don't have your index.graphql in the root then you tell it where it is so it's the root is in step zen so what i've done is i basically integrated the steps and stuff and the spell kit stuff so they just kind of live both okay. in the same repo it's kind of like a mono repo setup so you can run in one terminal your Svelte project, and that'll be on localhost 3000. And then your steps and one kicks off on 5001. It used to be 5000, but then Monterey comes with a built in thing running on 5000. Mm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. And then here now we have the Explorer. And so we can get the user, AJC web dev, and you get information. I think it's because I'm not giving the ID. I think there's two arguments. You have to say by username as well. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so now this is querying the the step zen API that we just spun up. And so we were okay. able to basically take the same schema and the same queries. And then the only thing I had changed was I um, took off the prefix because once it's the, the prefixes are partly so if you wanted to get users from two different backends, you don't want to just have get user as a query because then you'll you'll have name okay. you'll have name collisions across these different APIs that you're using. But if you're just doing a project where like you're just using this dev2 API, then you don't really need the prefixes. So I took it off because it's kind of like it's just additional okay. noise in your code that's not really necessary. Gotcha. Yeah. And can can you do aliases? Uh, or no? Yeah, you can. So like you do like a colon and like create the alias or something like that. I forget the, yeah, the specific syntax to do it because I don't do it very often, but that's a that's a thing you remember actually when I was showing Alex Trost on a stream, he okay. he did and I was like, Oh, you can I guess you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I saw uh, Alex pop in the in the chat here. Oh, mm -hmm. nice. Okay, so now we're gonna show how to actually connect to the API in Svelte Kit. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create, uh, instead of like a Svelte, Svelte file, we're going to create just a user.json.js file. And then okay. what this is going to do is this is going to allow us to actually do like a fetch in our project. So we're creating an ASIC function that's going to await a fetch call. And then we're going to get the data and then just return the data. And okay. we're also going to put in our steps and keys over here and so i will hop off <laughs> one more time to do that yeah. this will be 
That's the last time I gotta do that. And this will take just a quick second. So if you want to ask any questions or do yeah, any, I'm gonna, that, I'm gonna swing uh, Jay Tompkins uh, Sloan across the screen while I'm doing this. Um, <laughs> sorry, I've been meaning to use that. Um, um yeah no it, i mean it, I, again it, it's it's pretty neat how you're just able to get up and running really quick like i mean i know you've probably done this a few times but but uh yeah oh uh, ben myers is saying he like he loved the <laughs> the, the atrocious sloth going across the screen <laughs> <laughs> awesome yeah what's up ben thanks for hanging out yeah so like you said i've, I've already done this and this is like a project that i already kind of kind of built out but even as I was like building it, I was kind of amazed how how quickly I was able to get everything going. And it's partly just because there's like a lot of different tools you have to learn and different te <clears throat> technologies you have to learn to be able to move really fast with this stuff. So it's like yeah. partly there is there is a bit of a learning curve to it. But once you kind of get the conventions, the different things you're working with, everything is very like unified in a way that is like very, very cool. Awesome. Okay, I think let me just actually test this real quick. Make sure it works. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Um, you don't have a sponsor, so I'll say this uh, stream is currently sponsored by nobody, and I will drink some coffee. <laughs> sponsored by nothing and nobody. Yeah. I think my brain's still on vacation mode. First day back at work, so. Yeah. Hope everyone else had a good vacation. If you took time off, and if not, yeah. you should take some time off. <laughs> Def most definitely take time off. All right, cool. We're back here. No right, private so keys were shared. All right. Now, what we got going on here? This is if you've ever written a, a fetch call, should be pretty, pretty uh, comprehensible, and especially. If you've ever written a GraphQL fetch call, one of the cool things about GraphQL is that it's not really dependent on any specific technology because it is a query language for APIs. So people will frequently use Apollo to make GraphQL queries, or they'll use a library like GraphQL request, or they may mm -hmm. combine something like Graph uh, a React query with one of those things. And you actually don't need to do that at all. You can just make a fetch call. And what you do okay. is you all you have to do is tell it the content type is application JSON. There may or may not be an authorization header. So for some, like the Rick and Morty API, you wouldn't even need an auth header. And then you okay. have the body that you string of JSON not stringify, and then you input a query, and then the actual query itself. So with the back okay. takes is where the, the query starts that we wrote over here. And so if we were to get rid of that name there and just do that, it still works. So you have just okay. the query is inside those brackets, and then that gets set to query, which then gets set to body. So then this is like a JSON object okay. where the the you have the the key is query, okay. and the value is the query itself. In in terms of the the query name there, because you removed it, is is it tip, typically if you're doing GraphQL, will you omit a query name like you have here? And I is, like, like to I... have query names be for a couple of reasons because it's uh, great because this is the get user query is a general thing. Like I could be getting yeah. any kind of user depending on what's being fed into this URL. So right now I want to be more specific saying this query is going to get AJC web dev because that's what it's hard coded in there. So it's if it's yeah. like a query like that, that is always going to do the same thing then I would like to give it a more specific name. But then also okay. you need to have a name for it if you actually want to pass in query parameters. So if you were going to do okay, like, gotcha. uh, this thing and that thing, and then you change that to uh, that thing. And then, then you could actually pass in these instead of just hard coding it in. Okay, cool. I have a question about the. I'm kind of I'm kind of derailing your thing here a bit, but no, uh, when you <laughs> when when you specify the query parameters there, uh, does GraphQL under the hood handle like like for example if you're doing SQL, uh, 
you typically use parameters to avoid SQL injection and stuff. Does like, I don't, I don't know if there's a concept of, I feel like there's probably some kind of GraphQL injection attack too. Like, is that, is that well, mitigated by thing, GraphQL because, itself or? Because a GraphQL endpoint has to be like publicly exposed at some point, it basically makes you think about things like injection basically from the very beginning. So this is when I was talking about all this stuff okay. about authenticating and securing it. That's that's because by definition, you're exposing this thing that people get like chuck and queries into. So it's like, it's already, yeah, you, know, yeah. you have to think about the injection problem like from day one. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's uh, already kind of like thought about here because we're we're kind of locking it down from the perspective of, like the the dev part because we're we're authenticating through the dev one, but then we're also now authenticating through Step Zen as well. So the okay, I gotcha. Keys, yeah, we're putting in the endpoint. So the endpoint we got from here because when we deployed this, it actually sets it up on an endpoint. It's something that is can confuse people at the beginning. They see this logo host five thousand, they think like, oh, this is a like my my endpoint is like running on on local host but this is a way to query your actual endpoint which is living on this url right okay. here and that is what we're inputting into then our svelte project through this and then in our actual svelte component we then use this load function so this is the kind of the svelte kit part which is specific to svelte kit which is this specific load function which basically lets okay. you fetch from this endpoint in your project that you're kind of creating. And then you get the data back and you do data dot get user the query name and then whatever thing you want from the, the query name. So I'm getting name, I'm getting my GitHub username, I'm getting my location, summary, and then an image, set to an image tag. And then that's running okay. over here. Okay, and uh, just one more question. Uh, so you, you, you're fetching user.json, so that means that uh, that that's a serverless function that's in userjson.js, I imagine, because you have your API keys there and stuff. That's not exposed to the client. That Yeah, exactly. That's okay. the, the whole idea of, of why this is set up the way it is so that you can just have that there and then you're able to query it and if then we open our, our developer tools and if we check like our network request, we're not gonna see any GraphQL query here. Okay, which gotcha. is what would happen if you are doing it from the client, you would you could see that the query would like say XML or and then you can click it and then you can see the, the query itself. But this is all these are all just, you know, JavaScript files. Okay, cool. Yeah, I guess I, I was just asking because it looks like at least in Svelte Kit, like you the routes and the functions seem to they're all just in the same place i guess yeah you you can set up uh i think other folders to to kind of actually i'm not sure if you can nest it or not because for me like i the the simplicity of it is kind of what appeals to me in the beginning so i haven't tried to like configure it to do all sorts of other crazy stuff yet but you basically just like do do the route and then do uh a salt file for the route that will actually be in your project and then you can just start start okay. doing it so yeah cool cool all right and so i'm gonna grab a couple more things here so now we're gonna pull in our articles and you put those over here and articles and then when you save it will redeploy your thing over here so let's see if I just do that. So, so I guess so, when you're saying it's redeploying here, there there's like a bridge between the actual API and your local environment when you're running localhost five thousand. So yeah, so this is what I mean about the the API is not running on localhost five thousand. The API is here. So every time and this is uh then you have like a dev server that is watching your project. So whenever you you save uh, something and make a change to your schema, it automatically notices the change and then redeploys your API. So that uh, this okay. now endpoint gotcha. has this part now. So if I go back here, and if we check the Explorer, we see nothing has changed here, you have to refresh. So you okay. refresh and now we see those extra ones 
there. Okay. And so okay. to get the articles, we had this query here. And then that's good. So now this is running through our, our steps and API, which then means it's already connected in our Svelte project. So we can build out okay. another Svelte route to very quickly get that going. So we have in articles, articles.json. So this is going to look very similar to the other thing we were just looking at because we got yeah. a different, slightly different query now, which is going to be the get articles, but everything else is the same, still a fetch call, same keys, all of that. So this will be articles.json.js. And then this will be articles dot svelte and for anyone who hasn't seen svelte before the it's basically it's like a single file component so if you've used view before it, it's kind of like that we have okay. um basically a script which is this is the javascript part on top and then we have the html part down here which is the basically like you can do a component with like some svelte syntax so we're doing uh each so this is like a, a loop right here that's going to loop over the articles and then pull out title description and all that kind of stuff okay and gotcha oh nice so it's gonna be an accessibility warning right here <laughs> okay so now nothing's changing here as we're over on articles and then okay. this is now our articles page because it's pulling in the articles query here, and then we're looping over it here, and then we're setting the title to an H2, and we're putting that inside of a link. We're using the slug to link to the actual link of the article, and then we're getting the publish date and tags, and then the cover image and the description. So if we click this link, it'll take us to the actual thing. So right now we're already nice. pulling in all of my blog articles, which is mm -hmm. pretty cool. Go go read Anthony's articles. <laughs> and then let's pull in a couple more of these. So I also had podcasts. So we got podcasts here. It is the FS Jam podcast. And we got a couple listeners in the chat. Oh yeah, uh, Matt Matt Foley's asking. Uh, he kind of wanted to make you know like the old school word tags, like used to have it on blogs. I, I don't know if people still do that. He was looking to do that with uh, some Dev two tags, so that could be something interesting. Uh, I don't know if if we'll have time for that or if it's in the scope <laughs> of what we can do. But just throwing that Sorry, out there. So one more time about what about the tags? So there's like a. It's like a component, like I used to see it all the time in WordPress blogs, you'd have like a, a word cloud in it. So like something that had more relevance would be larger, for example. But uh, so so Matt was suggesting, hey, maybe we can pull in tags, uh, potentially tags for your own blog posts, I guess. And, uh, you know, you could weigh them and change like the font size, for, for example. Uh, we might, yeah, totally. You don't necessarily <laughs> so have to do all that. So we're pulling in the tags from them right here. So we do have that set as a specific okay. um, field on our schema. And then there's uh, ways to uh, like basically aggregate those together. So that is the thing we do. It take more time to build. I've got time for it right now. But that's something that you can start. You can actually with this with this API, you could even start doing analytics because you're getting things like follower counts. You're getting things okay. like um, number of likes for posts. So you, you have access to everything that's in the dev API. And so anything that you want gotcha. to pull in and any way you want to manipulate and any way you want to sort it and any way you want to display that data, all of that is is there, like ready to be basically done. Like it's all the data is at your fingertips. It's just about like, okay. how do you want to display it and how do you want to be able to, to work with it? But if you know how to use GraphQL, you already know all those things. You just got to translate that into queries on your front end. Cool, cool. Yeah. Okay. 
There you go, Matt. I expect that to be on my desk tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I had, I had jumped ahead and I built out this felt front end part before getting the schema part actually created. And then this is now pulling in all of our podcasts. So okay. the, you the, the dev API only gives you the the title and the the link. So you guys should give some more podcast stuff. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. And then let's see. So one thing that I actually did do, the rest is going to be pretty much similar stuff to what I've already been showing, but something else that I wanted to do is uh, make the front end a little nicer in terms of like pulling in different parts. So mm -hmm. okay, um, it was here. Yeah. So I'm going to modify the user endpoint a little bit. And okay. instead of just getting the user, I'm going to get the user and then I'm going to get my last five articles and my last five podcast episodes. So this would be like, if you mm -hmm. want to have your front page, just show like, right, these are the most recent things that mm -hmm. I've done. That's the idea there. And then pull this whole thing. And all that. So now we still are grabbing that user stuff, but then we're also grabbing the articles and displaying them and then podcasts and displaying them. And then we go back to our homepage. And so we got all that and you see most recent articles and most recent podcasts. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I'm not sure if we have it in the dev two API, but like you have the, there's this concept of being able to, uh, pin posts if you go to your profile on dev i imagine i'm not i'm not sure how it's surfaced in the api if it is but maybe it's a property on the article i'm not sure yeah yeah i'm not sure i'd have to check it out the last thing that i want to show is just how easy it is to then deploy this now so we've got uh these adapters already with svelte kit and this is going to let you hook into different deployment platforms. And so that could be Netlify, Vercel, Cloudflare Workers, um, Begin, and there's probably some others that I'm forgetting. So there's a, a lot of ways to hook in. Here's the actual adapters okay. page. And then you just do a, a node server as well. That's the other one. And then you gotta just get it on a, a Git repo. So we're okay. gonna git init. And if we notice here in our git ignore, we have uh, our dot emv. And then <clears throat> what we don't have though, and what we really want is we want our uh, config dot yaml as well. So we don't want to don't want to get commit your config.yaml. So always make sure that's in your, your git ignore. And then uh, I love repo.new. So this is my create repo. And then as soon as you get it on a repo, you then just need to, oh yeah, I think I skipped a, a step. There's also a uh, netlify.toml that will tell it the, the build commands. So yeah. this is just so you don't have to input it into the Netlify dashboard. It actually will auto detect these build commands. Okay, gotcha. And then you just got to connect your Netlify account to your GitHub repo. And then it puts in the build commands for you. And then I'm also going to have to give it 
my steps and keys. Oh, you mean uh, upload them to uh, to Netlify? Yeah, so this will be the environment variables that I had set, which is the endpoint and the Netlify, or the steps in API key, which is that's what's happening in the, the fetch request. Cool, cool. Yeah. And I know you said that you need to learn a bunch of things to be doing all this pretty quickly, but I'm still pretty impressed how fast we're building out something. Yeah, it's, if you're already kind of bond to a lot of the Jamstack stuff, then that's really great, especially for when you just like the deployment part, because deploying this stuff used to be a lot more challenging, but they have such yeah. great conventions now. So just pretty much gets all handled for you. Cool, cool. And we got a live yeah. site. Yeah, so this deploys really, really quickly because it builds pretty dang quickly. So if we look at the build time, three seconds, build one second for the function bundling, six seconds to deploy, like 10 second build altogether. So that's really nice. And then cool, there's cool. our project. Now we're live on the interweb. Articles. Very cool. And we got podcasts. Yeah. Awesome. And then obviously you can start styling it out however you want. I've actually recently discovered this thing, water.css, that I really okay. like, where it'll give you kind of like some CSS presets. Mm. Okay, and so not so much a CSS reset, uh, uh, just like some some out of the box styles. Yeah, it's basically so you don't have to write CSS classes or anything like that. It um, reads your your markdown and then kind of automatically gives you some some nice styles to go along okay. with it. There's there's a lot of these. I think um, MVP CSS. This is the first one that um, Ben Myers turned me on to. And then okay. he recently switched to Pico, which is, and so these ones are cool because they're, <clears throat> the idea is that they push you to write semantic HTML because it makes the semantic HTML look nice. It kind of uses that oh, as okay, like a base okay. convention and builds around. So that's pretty cool. So, so if your site looks crappy, it's because you've got some div soup going on. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now there's the, some styling to oh, look okay, a little yeah, bit yeah. nicer. Nice. Yeah, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So that is pretty much the whole demo. That was oh, awesome. That's super cool. <laughs> yeah. No. Yes, to me. Kids have decided to be really loud today, but I was listening <laughs> and learning. And I thought that was really awesome. <laughs> yeah. No, this is uh, super cool. I, yeah, I'm definitely gonna have to check this out because I I do wanna kind of resuscitate my my dev2 integration because right now like, like i was telling you i'm copy pasting my markup from my markdown from dev2 to uh, a markdown file locally which is 100 percent not efficient and it it means i have to update it in two places too so uh yeah i'm definitely going to check this out um so in terms of steps and studio like is there uh Obviously, it's a it's it's a paid product. But I imagine is there's there's some kind of no, developer steps in, the tier. Steps in the studio, the steps in the studio is not a paid product. It is totally free. Oh, can okay. Go on that endpoint and start using it and do exactly what I just did. No, and oh, wow. you, oh, no way. you don't even need a steps in account. So to the part that I showed you with Svelkit, that requires a steps in account, which is also free, <laughs> and mm -hmm. that is what lets you then okay. deploy the endpoint. But you can create an endpoint from the steps in studio itself without even needing to create an account. Oh, okay, okay, cool, cool. No, I'm I'm definitely gonna check this out. Um, and I, I'll probably ping you in uh, open source or somewhere, <laughs> in, yeah, in yeah, in one of the many discords. <laughs> yeah, because you know it's I, I'm obviously a developer advocate for steps in like the whole the whole point mm -hmm. is for me to show people this thing, get people using it, like get them to you know give me some feedback, and it's it's been a struggle to to make the pitch because it's such a high level thing. It's kind of like you can pull in anything and do anything with anything. It's, great right and there's like, <laughs> yeah. uh, 
Like, so yeah. what do I pull do in your do? grandmother's API, pull in your grandpa's API. Yeah. 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 But yeah. then, but once you kind of like actually get the, like what it's for and you start kind of looking at problems through like a step Zen lens, you start seeing like really the, what it's useful for. And it's like mm-hmm. getting projects spun up with a way for people to access data quickly is like such a useful, like badly needed thing just across all sorts of ecosystems. So yeah, if you think there's a problem that you have that could require pulling in data from somewhere and it's complicated and you need like a nicer way to pull in data, like this is the thing to use. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. That's no, it's, it's definitely cool. And the, and the UI looks pretty slick too. So uh, <laughs> I, I like User the little friendly. color coding sidebar. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, I was going to say, uh, if folks want to reach out to you, uh, where's, where's the best places to find you on the internet? Yeah, so I'm AJC Web Dev on Twitter and GitHub and Dev2. So all of those places, I got the same handle. And yeah, feel free, you can just uh, message me on Twitter. Um, that would be probably the easiest way to, to get in touch with me quickly. And then stepzen.com is where you can learn all about StepZen. And um, yeah, happy to chat about it or any other projects that people are interested in. I have like a wide ranging interest in many different parts of like the, the web development ecosystem, both you know, front end and back end. So i um, always happy to chat and give people advice if ever like trying to evaluate different pieces of tech or, or frameworks or, or what have you. Or if anyone wants to get involved in open source, I'm also like, I didn't really tell my story very much, but I first started in the open source movement with like redwood and by doing that mm-hmm. okay. got me noticed by a knot which was got me the the steps end job in, in the first place so in terms of like breaking into tech and how, how do you do that because i used to be a music teacher before i was a, a developer oh, no way. i've only been a ve- developer nice. for like the last couple of years and yeah and I actually went to lambda mm-hmm. school where uh, christina was teaching at the time <laughs> well she's a good teacher um no that's, I try. that's very cool <laughs> Yeah. Awesome. And uh, what was I going to say? Uh, yeah, it's escaped me. But uh, yeah, I just want to say it's been super fun. Uh, it's like, I-, I just like how we went from zero to hero in like about an hour with like a full fledged site. Like, obviously, you would probably still want to tweak the site. But I think it's just really cool how we were able to grab the Dev2 API or whatever APIs you're going to use integrate it pretty easily into the steps and studio to give you some kind of GraphQL API and then, uh, you know, Svelte or whatever you use for your front end. Uh, yeah, it was just super, super cool to see it go from, uh, zero to 60. So awesome. Thanks so much, Anthony. Yeah. I also just want to say that I think, uh, if anyone wants to reach out, you should just, you know, he was saying, reach out and talk about stuff because, uh, like you said, he was at, Lambda not too long ago, a few years ago, he's already in, you know, developer advocate job. And I think that's really awesome. I know how hard it is to get into a developer advocate job and, um, you know, talk to him about open source, talk to him about these things, see, you know, more of his story and reach out because I think that's really cool. And you're obviously a really good teacher as well, Anthony, as you taught us (laughs) steps in here. Yeah, I do enjoy teaching. It's been nice. (laughs) Yeah. For the last part of the stream, we will be doing piano lessons with Anthony. Uh, <laughs> hot cool, cross cool. buns. I can teach you hot cross buns. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or chopsticks. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week.